Believe it or not, it all starts with horses. Again. You've been living with a bunch of other tribes on the east side of the Zagros Mountains, and by and large, it's been pretty okay. The 12th century BCE has been no worse to you than it has to anyone else, and you've got yourself a nice little chunk of land in what will someday be northwestern Iran to look over. The only real problem you have is the Assyrians. See, the Assyrians are the big kid on the block. They've got an empire so big that it runs all the way to Egypt, and they aren't doing too bad for themselves. They've got cities like Nineveh, Ashur, and Nimrud, all full of palaces, canals, and gardens, and a bunch of other neat stuff. By the 7th century BCE, they've also set up quite the trade in slaves to help make it all possible. And really, what the Assyrians do is quite clever. They like to ride into town, capture all the people, and then forcibly move them to another settlement. That is, a settlement that used to be occupied by someone else the Assyrians had already come in and moved to yet another settlement, which used to belong to someone else who the Assyrians... Well, you get the idea. And it wasn't like the Assyrians were fixing things up in between occupants. No, the ruins of the settlements are left for the new arrivals to do the best with that they can which can be quite depressing, seeing as the method of capture is usually to burn the crops in the field and knock down all the houses as flat as possible. The new arrivals spend so much time trying to get a roof over their heads and put food on the table that they have very little time left to even think about rebelling. Which basically meant, as word spreads before them, by the time the Assyrian Empire begins nosing into your neighborhood... People are falling all over themselves to come to some sort of deal whereby they can stay where they are, and the Assyrians can add them to a list of conquered people with as little fuss as possible. As far as the Assyrians are concerned, they're in charge of your little piece of the world as well. Of course, your little piece of the world is basically the Zagros Mountains, which although the Assyrians are happy to march through your mountains on their way elsewhere via the nearby Khorasan Highway, they don't seem quite capable of keeping it all under control. Sure, they're happy to stage a military raid to knock down any rabble-rousers that might crop up, but when it comes to holding the area, not so much. The problem is the terrain. The mountains are forbidding enough just for being mountains, but they're bitterly cold in the winter, so much so that hardly anyone wants to be there long term. Except you and your tribe, the area. And the area, made up of all the different little tribes who come together in the region, they decide that the way to make it all work is to stick to the forests and valleys on the slopes of the mountains. Besides, the pastures that grow on the bottom of the valleys? Those are great places to do what your people have always done. Being full of clover, they make an ideal place to raise horses and cattle. The Assyrians, of course, know you raise horses out there in the mountains. It's hard not to know that, since you spend so much of your time riding around on those same horses. Practically any time they run across one of your tribesmen, you're riding a horse around. And what magnificent horses they are. Everyone knows the best horses of all come from the Aryan tribes of the Zagros Mountains, and the best of the best are bred by one group in particular the Medes. And since the Assyrians are, by their own reckoning, in charge of the Medes, they figure a fitting tribute is their pick of the finest horses around. Because Assyrians are no good at raising horses themselves. And thanks to your horses, they've come to rely on cavalry as the strength of their armies. The horses of the Zagros are the most important thing to the Assyrian Empire and her continued strength bar none. As the horses go, so too does the Assyrian army. Which is where it all starts to go bad for the Assyrians and good for you. The Aryan tribes often find it hard to get along with each other, but years of oppression by the Assyrians now make it a necessity. And that makes it more difficult to collect the tribute of horses Assyria so desperately needs as all the tribes unify which makes it harder to control your tribes, which means more and more tribal revolts are becoming successful, which means that pretty soon, hardly anyone is paying the Assyrians the tribute they demand. And with the horse tributes disappearing, the strength is going right out of the Assyrian army. Until, 
In 615 BCE, a man named Cyaxares is made chief of all the chiefs of the Medes. He swiftly allies with as many other rebel groups as he can, in addition to some Babylonians who are equally as tired of the Assyrians, and then you all march against them and come pouring out of the Zagros Mountains like a flood. So poorly prepared are the Assyrians that it takes only three years for the Medes under Cyaxares to reach the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, storm it, and raise it. And so, the unassailable Assyrian Empire ends, a smoking ruin, laid low by the cavalry of the new Median Empire. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. We've taken on a mighty task here. We promised you a history of the Persian Empire over the course of the month of April, and we aim to deliver it. But, of necessity, it's not going to be a complete and total history. We leave that to a theoretical Persian Empire history podcast and its two, we're sure, magnificent hosts. The other thing this isn't going to be is a takedown of that well-known film about the fight between the Spartans and the Persians at that one pass which was in the theaters a few years ago. Well, 14 years ago to be exact. And if that just gave you a heart attack, we apologize. That sort of thing has been happening to us for years now. Welcome to it. No, the reason we won't be tackling the film 300 and inspecting it for historical accuracy is that A, if you really want that sort of thing, head over to IMDB and look up the film. We're fairly certain you can fill up on that stuff in the goofs and trivia section of the listing, including the extremely helpful historical goof listing that, surprise, surprise, the Spartans and the Persians didn't actually speak American English. Even Wikipedia's page on the film covers the more glaring points, and probably with a bit more coherency. Reason two for not covering it, or B if you prefer, is that we already have, way back in our episode, Oracle. So feel free to re-listen to that. No, instead, we are going to look at Persia from, we hope, as much of the Persian side of things as we can. And the truth of the matter is, that's going to be pretty hard to do. The reason being, while there is some material written about the Persians of the time, some actual history written by the Persians, the vast bulk of it was written by everyone around the Persians instead. Case in point, Herodotus from last week's episode. While Herodotus started out as a Persian, and this did give him some insight into them, he was, by the time he wrote the histories, pretty much on the side of the Greeks. Hardly unbiased. Unfortunately, his was one of the few surviving works to discuss the period with which we are concerning ourselves in this episode. As a result, there isn't a lot on record about the Medians. And as a further result, this may turn out to be one of the shortest episodes we've done in a long, long time. The problem is we need to cover the period. There were a few important things that happened that will inform our understanding of later events, but there just isn't enough to go around a full-size episode without making it feel heavily padded with our own speculation, which we don't want to do. We know, for instance, that upon the defeat of the Assyrians, the Medes almost immediately inherited much of the northern part of the former Assyrian Empire. As a result, all the little kings of the Medians were now much bigger kings with much more land and resources at their disposal, and so they began conducting the business of new empires, pushing people around and getting into fights. By the early 500s BCE, they had already taken a swing at and connected with the Syrians and thrown a punch at the Lydians in modern-day Turkey, with whom they were forced to sign a quickly slapped together treaty thanks to their battle being interrupted by a solar eclipse. No sense upsetting the gods further by carrying on the battle if they didn't want one to happen. With the boundary between the two empires established at the Halys River, everybody was able to relax for the next few years. And in fact, very little is known about the religious beliefs of the Medians. It mostly seems to involve the interpretations of dreams and signs, like, well, we're fighting and there's an eclipse, let's see if stopping the fight makes the sun come back. 
Many people think the Medes were early practitioners of a sort of proto-form of Zoroastrianism, but little enough evidence of this actually exists. There was a sort of priest class called the Magi, but it's difficult to understand their precise role beyond interpreting dreams and prophecies. And boy was Sayazari's son and successor to the throne in his passing, Astyages, plagued with dreams that needed interpreting, each of which seemed to presage some sort of doom for he and his young empire. In one dream, Astyages' daughter urinates so much that all of Medea is drowned. When he asked the Magi, they interpret it to mean that her offspring will endanger the throne. And the Magi were all about that sort of thing. Darkness and shadow were evil lies that had to be prevented, even in one's dreams. And the Magi were capable of finding darkness everywhere, around every corner in the search for truth, even in places you wouldn't expect darkness to be. If you required proof of the omnipresence of darkness, all you had to do was look to scorpions, spiders, snakes, lizards, and ants. They were clearly the result of the spread of a universal shadow, the shadow made by lies, and should be eliminated wherever they were found, preferably with the fire of truth. If the Magi had an occupation beyond interpretation, it would be rooting out the darkness, because inside the darkness was the lie, and the lie could not be allowed to survive. Astyages took the Magi's warning to heart about his daughter Mandan's offspring. As quickly as he could, Astyages married Mandan off to one of the court vassals, a Persian prince from the middle of nowhere, and sent them packing to live quietly out of the way and far from home. It's important to emphasize at this point that the Medes weren't Persians, though they weren't far from it. Both groups spoke roughly the same language, and both were part of the same collection of Aryan nomads, and they even shared the same Magi. It's just possible that the Parsua people the Assyrians fought a couple of hundred centuries before when they were still a power to be reckoned with, moved south and became the group of nomads that would begin to establish a new kingdom between the Zagros Mountains and the coast of what is now the Persian Gulf, in a place formerly called Anshan. It would have then become the land of the Parsua, or Persia, so the story goes. The problem is, no one knows for sure if this is the true story or not, because no records of the Parsua during the possible transition period survive. Fortunately, with his daughter sent off to live far away from him with this shirt-tailed tribe, there could be no more threat to the king's throne. In any case, Astyages continued to expand the empire his father had established before he passed, and it soon became apparent that the Medes lacked something most of the other great empires of the day had. Up to then, he and the Medes had been content to move from camp to camp, setting up huge tents wherever they happened to be conquering next. While this was hardly fitting for the ruler of what was increasingly becoming a very large empire, what Astyages needed was a capital, complete with palace and treasury. And what better place for it than Ekbatana, the place where all the tribes used to gather to talk over their affairs and make decisions. Located near the top of the Zagros Mountains along the Khorasan Highway, it was the gateway to the Iranian Plateau. And what a palace they built there. According to Herodotus, the Medes built the city now called Ekbatana, the walls of which are of great size and strength, rising in circles one within the other. The plan of the place is that each of the walls should outtop the one beyond it by the battlements. The nature of the ground, which is a gentle hill, favors this arrangement in some degree, but it is mainly affected by art. The number of the circles is seven, the royal palace and the treasury standing within the last. The circuit of the outer wall is very nearly the same with that of Athens. On this wall, the battlements are white. Of the next, black. Of the third, scarlet. Of the fourth, blue. The fifth, orange. All these colors with paint. The last two have their battlements coated respectively with silver and gold. Certainly, Ekbatana meant that the king of the Medes now had his capital and his magnificent palace, both intended to demonstrate his power and command over the region. But equally certain was that the building of it pleased few other people. For the nomads of the region, it meant a curtailment of their free movement. Ekbatana sat at the crossroads of the Khorasan Highway, a trade route that effectively connected the Near East to the Western world. 
Not only that, but the palace overlooked the rest of the Zagros and made it far easier for Astyages to sortie out into the mountains at need to pacify any reticent tribes. And he'd effectively taken away the once freely open and available meeting place, making it harder for the heads of the various clans to get together and organize themselves. Suddenly, the Medes under Astyages felt themselves less free in service to the king and under his watchful eye, as well as his command. It began to be said that the people had even less freedom than they'd had under the Assyrians. And then, Astyages had another dream of ill portent. In this dream, his daughter Mandan gave birth to a vine. Despite everyone's best efforts, the vine grew and grew and kept on growing, covering the ground and casting shade over everything until it completely blotted the sun out from all of Asia. The king awoke in a panic and went to see his magi. Well, the meaning seemed clear, and the magi agreed. The son of Mandan, the king had been warned about in the previous dream, was about to be born. Astyages was about to be a grandfather. Few people had ever wanted it less. Upon the boy's birth, the king ordered him put to death and dispatched his most loyal chief and commander, Harpagus, to do the job. Harpagus went, dispatched the boy, and returned to report the mission complete. And so Astyages continued to rule all of Media, and reassured that nothing could end his reign prematurely. Which, if you know anything about the nature of stories, was completely wrong. In 559 BCE, a young man showed up at the foot of Astyages' throne and announced himself as Cyrus, the grandson of Astyages. His features were sufficiently similar as to be convincing, and his story was such that it at once enraged the king and made him fearful. Faithful Harpagus had not carried out his duty to the letter of the king's instructions. Instead, the baby was taken from his mother and abandoned on a mountainside, where he was soon found by either a shepherd, a bandit, or maybe even a nursing dog, depending on who was telling the story. Regardless of which one of them was true, they all presaged the arrival of a hero, possibly even a god. Of course, it might all be a lie as well, even the prophecies. It might just be that Astyages kept tabs on his daughter and subsequently grandson. Whatever the case, the boy was now a man and the king of the Persian tribe. Cyrus had taken his seat on the Persian throne and was far too good at the job. That made him dangerous to Astyages. Six years after Cyrus's ascension, the king decided enough was enough, and in 553 CE he saddled up and went south to war with Persia. The Medians outnumbered the Persians and nearly beat them to a surrender. But the Persians, at the encouragement of their women, managed to hold on. And so the fight dragged out over the next three years. Until suddenly it didn't. Word went out that the Persians had won and that Astyages had been captured and taken to Persia, and no one really seemed to know how or why it had happened. Except loyal Harpagus. When Cyrus had presented himself at the Median throne and revealed Harpagus's lie, King Astyages had, it was said, exacted a terrible revenge for the betrayal. Astyages killed Harpagus' son, and then prepared the boy as mutton before serving him to the unwitting Harpagus. When the punishment was revealed, Harpagus swallowed his pride, along with his son, and remained a loyal servant to the king. Sometime thereafter, the king had given Harpagus supreme command of the army, leaving him in charge of the plans to defeat the Persians and Cyrus. Which, of course, Harpagus could not do. Especially in light of the king's sadistic punishment. Far better, it must have seemed to Harpagus, to serve under the rule of the man whose life he had spared 
than the man who had fed him his son. So in the midst of battle, Harpagus and his troops rebelled and took Astyages captive and handed him over to the Persians. At least, that was the story told. What is more likely is that the Medes increasingly chafed under the strict rule of Astyages and saw in the Persians a people very much like themselves, which they were. They were both Aryan, both essentially nomadic, and as far as the people of each were concerned, the Medes and the Persians were more alike than not. As Astyages' rule became more oppressive, the obvious solution presented itself. Why not, they thought, have a new ruler? And not just anyone, but how about the head of the Achaemenids? In turn, the leading family of the Pasargade, the leading Persian tribe. Someone worth following. Someone who understood what it meant to lead the tribes while also observing the proper procedures and rituals of court. Someone who would remember the past and look to the future. Well, why not indeed? Cyrus had already proven his worth on the throne of Persia. Cyrus was the natural choice, and Harpagus opened the way for him. But Cyrus was merciful, and probably extremely clever as well. Rather than enslave all the Medeans he could, rather than punish, humiliate, or even destroy Astyages, Cyrus sent him off into retirement and allowed the Medes to become part of his new Persian empire just as they were. Instead of disgrace, the Medes joined the Persians as full partners in almost everything they did and filled positions as officials and generals under Cyrus. He did empty the treasury, but he also kept Ecbatana as it was. It was a strategically placed city that would also serve as Cyrus's summer palace, being as it was high up in the cool mountains. And so it remained the capital of the Median province, but also became in the summer the capital of all of Cyrus's empire. And with that, the Median Empire, barely 60 years old, ended, and that of the Persians began. But the defeat of the Median Empire put the whole region in turmoil, and barely anyone outside of Media knew who the Persians even were. And if Cyrus was ever going to earn his moniker, Cyrus the Great, he was going to have to deal with the old enemy of the Medes, the Lydians and King Croesus, first. Thank you for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We hope you're looking forward to more of our series on the Persian Empire and learning about all the greats to follow. If you'd like to help support the show or even just show your appreciation for our efforts, head over to our support page at gmwordoftheweek.com and join our other supporters, without whom this episode would not be possible. We owe much of this episode to Tom Holland and his book Persian Fire. Without it, this would be even shorter than it already is. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian, the merely okay, Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. There's no quote down here. I don't know why you're looking.